I'm sure I'll be in the minority here again. Sounds like a broken record. It is certainly something I'm used to being in the minority. But I didn't enjoy NXT TakeOver quite as much as a lot of these other people did that are just gushing about NXT TakeOver Toronto. Over the moon about NXT TakeOver Toronto. I just, I just didn't. Now, notice the key phrase here I'm saying. I didn't enjoy it nearly as much as others. Doesn't automatically mean that I think the show was bad or that it sucks or that there weren't performers that I enjoyed here or matches that I enjoyed here. Because I did. I had matches that I enjoyed, characters that I enjoyed. There were elements of the show that I really liked. Now, we get kind of ridiculous here with the people sucking up the NXT TakeOver shows every time they happen. Like, every show is great. Every show is awesome. Okay, then what is actually truly great and awesome? They can't all be great and they can't all be awesome. Just stop. Because when you start saying that, that means your benchmarks for great and awesome have shifted and changed, which means you need to raise your standards. But unfortunately, what has happened instead is that in professional wrestling, the standards have been lowered so much that good becomes great and great becomes all time legendary and mediocre can still be good and crap can still be good. That's where we're at now. Um, yeah. I'm sure I'll get flamed away on the dislikes button on this video, and I'm sure I'll get flamed away in the comments, and that's cool. It's okay to have different varying opinions. I'm just bringing a different perspective, perhaps. Now, like I said, I'm not here to rag on every element of the show. There are legitimately things that I really liked, such as Mauro Ronaldo on commentary. One of the refreshing things I know every time that I click onto the WWE Network and I watch an NXT show is I know I'm going to hear Mauro Ronaldo on commentary, and I know he's going to be really, really good. He might have a face for radio, but his voice for wrestling play-by-play -play commentary on TV is fucking golden. He has energy level, passion, and enthusiasm that we just do not hear in many other places of commentary. Raw, SmackDown, and lots of other companies too. He tells the story. He sets things up well. He sets his color commentaries up well, even if they stink. The dude is just it. The dude is legit. So it is at least if refreshing, if nothing else, when I tune into an NXT TakeOver show that I'm going to be able to listen to a guy for three hours that actually knows his shit, gives a shit, and does his shit. And Mr. Ronaldo, for that, I thank you and salute you. Oh, just saying, man. Just saying. But you start off this show with the Street Profits versus the Undisputed Era. Tag title match. And I look at Montez Ford. This is my first chance actually checking out the Street Profits, if, if I recall correctly, the Street Profits in an actual match. I've seen him on Raw here and there, being hype men and so forth. But damn, Montez Ford really does have some star qualities. Handsome fella. He can talk. He's got a natural personality and char charisma about him. And then you can see that he has like kind of next level athleticism compared to a lot of other guys, even in his size range. Like the biggest thing he's probably missing is just sheer size. He has star qualities to him. He has it factor to him. And I hope that eventually when he's full time on the main roster, he doesn't get lost in the shuffle because there is something about that dude. I'm just saying. Now, surely you're going to have the people that are going to be like, Oh my God, Kyle O'Reilly and Fish fucking have it factor two. And they're like, don't. They're literally like, literally, literally just another guy. Both of them, just another guy. What is so different, what is so unique, what is so special about their vanilla asses compared to literally hundreds of other guys throughout professional wrestling in the world today. Like, I still don't understand what the big deal about this Undisputed Era faction is. What the fuck do they do that is so special? And what the hell is so special about O'Reilly and Fish? I'm sorry, the answer is absolutely nothing. Like, answer me. What is so special about these guys? Nothing and you know it. That said, this opening match was really, really good. Like, this was a nice, hot start to the show. I really enjoyed it. You know, got a little bit of an element here, which was a common theme throughout the night. Of, there were a couple of moments where I felt like you could have finished the match, you hit a move that should have finished the match, and it ultimately didn't. And every once in a while you can get away with that. But when you literally have a match 
full of those false finishes and those near misses. It builds up throughout the course of the night, and it, it just can get to be too much. But on its own, this opening match was really, really good. And I could argue the next match, Io Shirai versus Candice LeRae, was even better. To me, this match was vastly better than the Baszler-Yim match for the NXT Women's Championship. There was story here, easy to understand and relate to characters on both the heel and the face side. These two ladies went out there, they were savage. From the bell, Candice LeRae, up and Shirai, not sitting there waiting for all the formal introductions. Your back turned her turned on you, fucking beat you up, go get her ass. Love it. This match was really, really good. It was really, really good. And while Vince probably thinks that Io Shirai looks just like Kairi Sane and Asuka and every other Japanese or Asian female wrestler that he has, hopefully now he understands that there's something a little different about her. Or at least knows that she's a different person. Because I almost am convinced that if you told Vince that Asuka was Kairi Sane, or that Asuka was Io Shirai, he probably would believe you. Do any of you doubt that? Do any of you doubt that? Do any of you doubt that? Think back to the old shoot interview that Kurt Hawkins did when he's telling the story about Vince pulling everybody together to announce the PG stuff, and Michael Tarver gets up and asks a question, and he calls him Shelton. Just saying, just saying. But this match was really, really good, and I enjoyed it quite a bit. I also enjoyed the kind of impromptu stuff between Matt Riddle and Killian Dane. Not everything needs to be an announced match or have structure or anything like that. It's just this stuff kind of happened. I don't know why you had to take out the fucking security dude with you when you went down, fellas. But shit, this worked. Matt Riddle been in the news quite a bit, so it makes sense to have him on one of your bigger shows. Absolutely. Him and Killian Dane, this felt like just a real fight. Not everything needs to be a fucking long, drawn-out, structured wrestling match. For what it was, I thought this was really cool. I really, really did. Um, and then the North American title match, Velveteen Dream has it factor. Note again that he did not win the season of Tough Enough that he was on because that speaks to the stupidity of both the WWE and, frankly, WWE fans and viewers. I will really, really want to see long-term how this whole gimmick shtick plays out once it gets to the main roster. But in terms of pure dudes with some it factor, with some star quality, again, Velveteen Dream has it. I still am searching to understand why Pete Dunne is such a big fucking deal. And I thought it was interesting that he was the one that took the fin pinfall here. And again, I look at Roderick Strong and I'm like, what the hell is so different or special or unique about him? He literally is just another guy. Just like everybody not named Adam Cole in that Undisputed Era faction that I still don't understand what purpose it really serves here. But nonetheless, this North American title match, even though, again, some of those same elements of too much, other moments that maybe the match should have ended but didn't, it still worked. Still at this point in time, I wasn't totally turned off on this show. So I was good up to this point. The NXT Women's Championship match was where it started to kind of go sideways for me a little bit. Like, I really wonder with Shayna Baszler, what's the long-term plan? She's pushing 40. She's been here on NXT for a long time. Are you just going to keep her there forever? As far as Mia Yim, now she's got a good story, but the, the character is like all types of weird. I didn't really know what to make of it at this point. And again, first real exposure to Mia Yim on the NXT roster. I'm like, okay, so she's a big badass, but yet she's fucking tapping out. Like, uh. This is an example of where I talked about before that some of the faces and names change, but the match is still the same. So what difference does it make? I feel like I've seen the Shayna Baszler match with other ladies. What was so different or special here? And in this particular case the other character that she was facing just, just doesn't work for me the same as maybe some of the other ones that she has. So it was a little harder to really get into this. I'm not saying it was horrible. I'm just saying it was a no for me, dog. That's all I'm saying. But then we get to the match. That surely it's going to piss a lot of you off what I have to say. I don't care. I'm going to say it anyway. I've been doing that for years. What the hell? Stop now. This NXT Championship match, two out of three falls. Skip de skip and whoop de woo. Basically, an hour of indie jerk fuck fest. That's what it was. It was a big old spot fest circle jerk. 
think these guys already had a two out of three falls match a couple of shows ago, didn't they? Did we really need to have two out of three falls? Well, the first one is a standard wrestling match, and the second one is a street fight, and then the third one is a barbed wire baseball bat steel cage fucking match. Vince, we're going to be sophisticated. Also, Vince, we're going to have a barbed wire steel cage match at a big four fucking NXT shop. Yeah! Honestly, another example of just because a match can go an incredible length of time doesn't mean it always needs to. I think this match went 45 plus minutes and with all the other bullshit you're looking at around an hour for everything. Intros and time of dream matches, da 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 da. Could we finish this up a little sooner, Junior? Would it have been better to just have one single stipulation, have it be the barbed wire steel cage match, and keep it to 30 minutes or less? Just like sex. Sometimes you can't go longer. Sometimes shorter is best. And fellas, if your lady ever tells you after 15 minutes she can't get it and you got yours, well, it sounds like a personal problem to me, bitch. That's all I'm saying. But! It's just it's too much. Like the first fall is this really long, drawn out, standard wrestling match. Numerous times where we could have just fucking ended it and then we didn't. And then it ends because Gargano hits Cole with the steel chair and he gets DQ'd. And this is where it can be hard for me as a guy that likes logic and gravitates to logic to sometimes be a fully invested wrestling fan. Because at this point in time, Adam Cole being the heel, so to speak, even though he is clearly over as the face in Toronto. Adam Cole, bang, ah, is up one to nothing. The next match is a street fight where the stipulation is it's a street fight, meaning there's no disqualifications, no countouts, and all things and everything fucking goes. Why the hell at this point wouldn't Undisputed Era, who had already had a bad night because all their guys had lost, why the hell wouldn't they rush the fucking ring, beat the brakes off of Gargano, and have Adam Cole win and finish it? Be done quickly. Instead of sitting there and going through a whole street fight by himself to then have to do a barbed wire steel cage match. Like I realize, yes, maybe it would have been a real momentum killer for the damn show. You've got maybe a point there for sure. But this is again where I'm talking about I can struggle separating logic from wrestling reality because logically, it made absolutely no sense. Wrestling reality, it probably made perfect sense and maybe that is part of the problem. But once you got past that first fall that went entirely too damn long as a standard wrestling match to get to that finish, I'm like, okay, let's wrap it up, juniors. Instead, you got about another 30 damn minutes. And there does get to be a point in time where guys are just doing Young Bucks type of shit, and it's mirroring so much of what you see in other places on the independent circuit and in the wrestling circuit around the world. The characters don't matter. There's no story. These guys are just bumping to pop the crowd and mark for themselves. And that's exactly the way the hell this match came across. And I don't know how the hell it couldn't, especially as the match went along. And I'm sorry. No. I'm not just instantly thrilled because these guys do some high-risk shit. Everybody does high-risk shit now. What's the difference? That's the point. What's the difference? Why would I care whether Cole or Gargano hits this spot or does not hit this spot? Why the hell would I care whether this guy wins or doesn't or this guy loses or doesn't? There is no emotional investment in any of these guys. There is no story for any of these guys. Even if you say, well, they've had a couple really long matches before. In and of itself doesn't mean that has to be a story. Well, Adam Cole beat him before in a street fight or in a standard match. So we wanted to beat him again in a standard match. Who fucking cares? Just have one goddamn match, 30 minutes, barbed wire, steel cage. Get it fucking done and over with. And you got, you're hitting fucking multiple Canadian destroyers. You're doing all this other shit. And none of these moves are actually finishing the damn match. Again, you get to the point where you become desensitized to it. And you're going to get to a point that in order to pop the crowd, guys are going to have to break limbs. You're going to have to break their neck. And then eventually, in order to pop the territory, you're going to have to have somebody die in the ring. This is not just some old fuddy-duddy crap. The business changes, yes. That doesn't mean the business always changes for the better. You know, when you look overall, 
You have the hardcore fans that are as passionate as ever, even though their numbers are not nearly what they once were. And you have fewer casual and mainstream eyeballs on wrestling than you have had in a very, very long time, if ever. There's a reason for that. People like stories. They like larger-than-life characters. They don't just want to see fucking crash test dummy stunt devils do a bunch of this crap with no purpose or no meaning. And I mean it, like... Anybody could go out there and bump. Like, a lot of you watching this video could literally go out there and do a lot of the extreme shit and bump around like they fucking do. Now, may or may not be able to execute the Canadian Destroyers multiple times. But what the fuck does it matter? Because it wasn't the finisher to the damn match anyways. Most all of you can fucking fall from the top and land on a fucking table. Like, part of the purpose to me of watching wrestling would be to watch guys do stuff that we wouldn't feel like we could do. That's part of the appeal. That's part of what should make them special. That's part of what should make them feel unique. And when they're doing the same moves as so many other people on the damn show, when they are doing the same style of match as so many other people throughout professional wrestling, when they are doing all this other crap to where none of these moves matter, they don't sell any of this bullshit, and it's just spot to spot to spot to spot to spot, it's not hard to see why fans don't get emotionally invested in characters. It's not hard to see why fans don't get emotionally invested in matches. And it's not hard to see why the hardcore nerds that have no standards nowadays that are just thrilled by the cheap thrill and have lowered their standards so much even subconsciously where they don't realize that they're going to be satisfied with just about any crappy throw out there as long as it happens in a ring and it happens to have some extreme elements to it. The rest of us are left wanting so much more. Just because you can do a fucking hour with three falls within a match doesn't mean you need to. One match was all that was necessary. Do your barbed wire steel cage match, fine. But get on with it. Like, seriously, just get on with it. The fact that so many people are now going to tweet about this being match of the fucking year makes me sick to my stomach. No selling. None of the moves really fucking mattered. And a lot of the shit that they did in the match, frankly, you feel like you could have done yourself. That's not special. That's backyard bullshit. That's what NXT's main event here felt like to me. It was a lot of backyard bullshit. And if you like backyard bullshit, fine. But don't sit there then when you see people post backyard bullshit online going knock said backyard bullshit when you're supporting it here be better people and specifically nxt be better stop going for the low-hanging fruit and the lowest common denominator have some goddamn standards and try to actually make some stars instead of jerking yourselves off to the same crowd of people that you always freaking do to where when these guys go to the main roster, they don't have a fucking shot in the world of making it. You think it's bad now. <laughs> Vince is going to be more involved in NXT. <laughs> have fun with that. Oh, yeah. The main event ruined a lot of this night for me. It's just too much. There's no appeal there. There is no entertainment factor there. It's just a bunch of test dummy crap with no purpose, no story, no selling. I've seen enough of that in wrestling over the past decade. I'm going to sit there and sheepishly geek out for it now. And maybe that's why OTR Essential is not the wrestling show you want, just the wrestling show you need. Because I'll have the courage to call it like it is. Because that's exactly how the hell it is. Can't wait till the next time we have another NXT TakeOver show and everybody's talking about how fucking great it awesome is too, no matter whether it is or isn't. Ugh.